Folks, you are in for a treat today. We are going to be talking to one of my friends, one of the outstanding independent journalists we've been talking about that are fighting against weaponized government. And this is Tracy Beans of UncoverDC.com. Hey, Tracy. Hey, what's going on? Do people really call you Beans? They do. My husband calls me Beans. Beans is on my Christmas stocking. Where does the name come from? Um, <laughs> well, remember back in the 90s when they started saying cool beans like it was actually cool? Don't tell me that. Dead serious. I hated it. My boyfriend started calling me beans and it stuck. So that's where it comes from. I love it. Uh, yeah. tell, tell people a little bit how you got into journalism, how you started doing investigative journalism. Then we're going to cover down on Missouri v. Biden because I think that's going to be so interesting to most people who are not paying attention. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, journalism. Wow. Well, it really took off. I kind of was writing my entire growing up. I, I wrote for the school paper. I wrote for Newsday on Long Island, if anyone knows what that is. Um, business, you know, magazines and stuff like that. But then I got into politics um, and people didn't know anything, really. Um, people were kind of just opening their eyes to what was going on. And when it really kind of became the thing I decided to do was when WikiLeaks dropped the Podesta emails because nobody understood why it was important that Citigroup was choosing Barack Obama's cab cabinet. Like, why did that matter? Who are these people? What are their connections and stuff like that? So I started writing and teaching people all that stuff. And it kind of just took on a life of its own. And then, you know, people, um, it was like, let's place some op-eds for you, you know, places. And, and then it was, well, we're really not wanting to talk about that right now because, you know, it's a little controversial. And I'm like, well, forget this. I'm just going to start my own thing because who wants that? So I did. And uh, here we are a few years later. So when did uh, Uncover DC get launched? <laughs> you're going to I don't even it was Roughly, five years I, 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 about five years ago. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. OK, about five years ago. And you've been doing that. You're the editor in chief over there. You guys have some great reporting and one of the uh, better stories, I think, about the uh, the whistleblowers that came out with me. So that was actually how I got turned on to your stories. I started watching you thread about Missouri v. Biden. Will you set up what this case uh, where it came from? And then we'll get into what it's about. Yeah, for sure. I saw this hit. Um, it's the states of Missouri and Louisiana who decided they were going to sue the the federal government uh, about, you know, coercing social media companies to censor American speech. So it's different than most. It's not a, an individual uh, suing a social media company for being banned. It's the actual government suing the government for stepping into that relationship where they don't belong. And I saw it hit, it was May of 2022. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a big one. Now I was censored basically everywhere uh, then, but I, I started reporting on it immediately. And it's kind of just taken off from there in ways I didn't even really imagine it would, but it's huge. We talked uh, at the beginning of this week, I talked to Matt Taibbi. I think that was one of the first scenes that people were starting to see kind of behind the curtain. And as I understand it, I think, think this actually came, predated that. They, the governments of Missouri and Louisiana actually sort of had an instinct that this was going on. And so they're kind of both pulling at different ends of the same curtain, maybe, and looking behind it in different ways. Is that accurate? Pretty much. I mean, we got a lot of discovery out of the case that tracked with what Matt Taibbi uncovered in the Twitter files after Elon Musk let him look under the hood. Um, but we were getting stuff. I mean, we were getting some really insane stuff, especially coming out of the White House Digital Communications and Strategy Office run by Rob Flaherty, who conveniently is now no longer in the White House, but is now on Joe Biden's campaign staff. Um, <laughs> they like to do that. They like to. As yeah, a matter what, of fact. What what does that shuffle look? Why Why do you think that is? Well, because it's hard, you know, when you're suing an office, so they're not suing the individual who occupied that position. They're suing the office itself. And they pulled the same kind of thing with Jen Psaki. And it's interesting because Dinesh actually covered this on his show, um, the article that I wrote about it, like, I don't know, about six to eight months ago. Because what they do is they'll shuffle somebody out, they'll, they'll replace them with someone. And then when it comes time for depositions, that person can say, well, I wasn't here, I don't know. And it just kind of gives them that other level of being able to get out of producing what they know exists. But eventually, especially when you have judges like the judge in this case, you really nail down into it and you get what you're looking at. But Rob Flaherty, would literally treat Facebook executives like a battered wife. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, he would curse them out and he would accuse them of things and gaslight them and threaten them to do as he says, or else we wouldn't want the White House to be angry with you. You know, we wouldn't you wouldn't want you wouldn't want something to happen to your family. It's almost as that that 
level of, of vitriol coming from the White House surrounding numerous topics. Um, take down that vaccine stuff. Take down that COVID stuff. Take down uh, that joke about Jill Biden that's floating around on your platform. I mean, everything, everything. So this is what they've been doing. So there's two things you just kind of exposed. One of them, I think, is the uh, you're a New Yorker, you know, the shell game, right? So the shell (laughs) game is you're keeping the P moving and there's always a shell over the top of it. So they're moving the people out of the office. Plausible deniability would be the government word for it. And then on top of that, they're also doing a very nasty kind of carrot and stick thing. Like you want to have access to the White House, don't you? It'd be a real shame if we didn't want you to be coming here. It'd be a real shame if we started uh, pushing a bunch of regulations on you, yep. which was something we saw from the Twitter files. That was like um, Senator, who was it? Um, Mark, was it Mark Warner? That was yeah. kind of proposing some real heavy and, and obviously expensive regulations. So you've got the carrot and the stick game, and they're also kind of moving people out to try to keep them out of the lawsuit. Is the government successful in keeping these people out of the lawsuits? Um, yeah, they are. I mean, all they have to do is fire them. They fired almost everybody that's been deposed so far. Uh, you know, the, the, the gentleman underneath, uh, Vivek Murthy, um, all kinds of folks are gone that were there before. And the interesting thing is this. So this is how it went just to give everybody a timeline real quick. They filed the lawsuit. They asked for a temporary injunction that would bar the government from doing any of this stuff and speaking with social media companies about any of that stuff. So no longer could you, you know, ring up the the CEO of Twitter and say, you need to take this post down. Otherwise, we might have to look at Section 230 or you need to remove these accounts. Otherwise, we might have some people come to your offices and sit with you about antitrust. And that's the kind of stuff that they were doing. So the judge in the case says, "Okay, well, we first need to prove somehow that this is actually going on. So they asked for some limited discovery. So they were limited to this very small little group of people and and offices that they wanted to grab discovery from to prove out that they needed the temporary injunction at all. So all of the things that we're seeing released now come from that very limited subset of of discovery in leading up to the temporary injunction. So we're not even into the case. Well, we are now, but we weren't even really into the case. All of the things that happened so far are all the government wincing in the sunlight over a temporary injunction, which just bars them from doing things they shouldn't do anyway for, I don't know, a year or two until the case plays out. So they're basically arguing that they need to be able to censor people and that the temporary injunction that very specifically bars them from coercing social media platforms to censor is an obstruction of their right to free speech. Interesting. The government thinks that they have a right to free speech is, and they is what they're do. arguing. They do to an extent. However, this injunction doesn't do anything to stop them from going on social platforms and saying, ivermectin is horse paste. It doesn't stop them from doing that. It just stops them from coercing social media companies to stop other people, individuals, from sharing their views. As a matter of fact, interestingly, in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals oral arguments, one of the attorneys for Louis, the Solicitor General from Louisiana and um, also Missouri, their conversation about the lawsuit was banned from YouTube because of what they're talking about. And the Fifth Circuit judges really couldn't believe that. They were stunned by it. And so all along the way, the government's lost. I mean, at every level, they've just lost and lost and lost. And then it went in front of the Supreme Court, the injunction that was granted by the district court judge in Louisiana, and then by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, now is at the Supreme Court. And in a very rare happening, um, there was a dissent to this. They they agreed they're going to take the case and hear it, but they put an indefinite stay on this injunction, which means through election season, the government can tell social media companies to do whatever they want because this thing is stayed until the Supreme Court takes it back up again. And Alito and Gorsuch and Thomas wrote a dissent to that decision saying you're basically saying that, you know, what everybody worries about is true. You're 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 giving them carte blanche to interfere in Americans free speech rights throughout an election season, um, most consequentially, but in general at all. And so that was kind of interesting to see as well. So Dinesh got into a a uh, a film that was called Police State, a whole, you know, sort of oh, uh, investigation <laughs> into this kind of thing. And, and what's amazing to me about this is uh, the people on the political left are arguing there is no police state. Obviously, you and I think differently. Mm-hmm. 
I think it's very interesting that in 2023, with all of the visibility of social media, with all of the speed of news and the fact that you really can't suppress stories nearly as much as you'd like to uh, if you're the federal government, they are trying to prove that there is no police state and there's no censorship apparatus through censorship and police state tactics. <laughs> like, could you make this up in a timeline? It's really bad. And, you know, listen, you know, Matt's not a, a conservative. OK, you know, as that stated, and, and, yeah, as stated on, on the show here just a couple of days ago. Yes. And neither is Michael Schellenberg a, a conservative. Right. I mean, they're not. They're they're classical. I would say classical liberal, um, very, very big proponents of free speech, which everyone should be. And what I'm finding interesting is that you notice this all the time. Our ideas in the marketplace float to the top all the time. And they absolutely cannot have a populace informed about all of the things that we've all been talking about for years now. Otherwise, they lose their stranglehold and they don't have a police state anymore. So that's what the the root of all of this is. It's a very foundational concept in our country that should not be trampled all over. The First Amendment. I mean, it's the First Amendment. <laughs> it seems so so uh, self-evident at that point. What's fun is that talking to Matt, he was saying the entire premise of this is creating an artificial reality that is fed through media, that's fed through social media and so on. But it's by throttling things on the back end. And the, and the only way that works is people have to have a fundamental belief that the algorithms are fair. And that's a mistaken belief. And that's sort of at the root of what uh, Missouri v. Biden and what the Twitter files kind of started showing, both of them from the same time. Can you talk about the number of companies that are involved in this? Because that may actually shock people. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the other thing, there's a couple different things with what you just said. I'll do, I'll go quickly if I can. Um, Please. Number, number one, talking about algorithms. So one of the things that happened that was kind of just a real big karmic slap was that, you know, Biden and, and and Flaherty were demanding that Instagram tighten up their algorithm to find vaccine hesitant content and get rid of it. Right. So they forced Instagram meta to make a new algorithm to remove this content. And all of a sudden, the White House account, the Biden account starts decreasing in engagement. It's not picking up followers. They can't figure out why. So they're they're yelling at Facebook executives. What's going on? Meta executives. I keep saying Facebook. What's going on here? Why is this happening to the White House account? Well, it turns out they wrote their algorithm so well that it was picking up pro vaccine content as well and censoring that. So Biden was a victim of the very censorship he wanted everybody else to have to deal with. And they lost their minds. I mean, expletive after expletive in these emails back and forth with meta executives about why the, the official White House and Biden account were having these, these problems. Number two, every social media company is involved. Now, the big ones in this lawsuit are, you know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Google, um, Twitter, formerly Twitter. But the most interesting thing to me is the only real willing participant in this who didn't need to be cajoled and threatened was Google. Not not surprised that Google is so pro, I don't know, corruption, pro communism, but surprised at how much Facebook and Twitter even at the time really fought back against this. Facebook had a whole argument about why Censoring vaccine related content and people's stories about what happened to them when they took the vaccine would actually turn into like a Streisand effect and have the opposite effect as what they intended it to. Oh, you mean um, they've, they've actually seen how human beings work? <laughs> yeah. Like they had some idea like, oh, our our therapists and our people are telling us that we probably really shouldn't do this. It was basically like if someone screams in a forest, can you hear them if nobody's around or if a tree falls, can you hear it? Um, because they were they were they were censoring people, but they weren't telling them, like you just mentioned, the algorithm wasn't saying, oh, sorry, you can't say this. It was just making it so no one could see it. So imagine, and they were, they were taking down groups of people talking about these things too. So imagine you're injured, trying to get some answers from somebody, some sympathy, something, and you're screaming into a void for months at a time because Facebook was told by the White House that they don't want anybody to see anything negative you might have to say about the mRNA shots. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. We're going to dig into more of this right after the break. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll come right back with Tracy Beans, who's the editor-in-chief at UncoveredDC.com. The program today is also brought to you by Relief Factor. I've got a couple of buddies that like Relief Factor. Not everybody sits every day and feels pain-free the way I do. People say, hey, what's your secret? My secret is clean living and a pure heart. It's too late for you on that one. If you've got pain, you've got to solve your problem another way. How about Relief Factor? 
It's a supplement that is going to use non-drug solutions to get rid of the pain in your life. What kind of pains? Neck pains, back pains, aches, neck pains? Really? Is that what you guys are doing? Stop looking down at your desk and start looking at relieffactor.com. We'll go ahead and tell you a little bit. It's a daily supplement. It helps your body fight against pain, 100% drug-free. It's developed by doctors who were saying, hey, drugs are not the best way to do this. Can we do something other than mask the pain? Can we attack the source? How about attacking the inflammation? It's full of a unique formula, natural ingredients like turmeric and omega-3. They're just trying to help you get through your day. Like I said, it's too late for you for the clean living in a pure heart. You can start going forward now, but why not you try Relief Factor to try to support your body's natural responses against inflammation? You can get started with a three-week quick start set. It's $19.95, less than $20, comes with a money-back guarantee. Feel better, or they'll give you your money back. Why not give it a try? It's relieffactor.com. Again, relieffactor.com. Yes, there's two Fs in the middle there. Or you can call the 800 number. It's 800, the number four, relief. 800 for relief. And when you feel the difference, you know it works.